So thanks for having me. So my first time here. Um, I'm already a long time working uh, um, in this industry. Um, senior marketing manager means that you're doing something for a long time and I love it. I've been on broadband edge as one of my long standing topics since the last 20 years or so, seeing all the evolutions from triple play. And now I think we're entering a, a really important next phase of the whole evolution with AI. And um, in my presentation, I want to go over a few things um, that I think are fundamentally important to network service providers. Uh, first of all, uh, is the AI ads and inferencing. You probably see all the activity going on in big data centers and training. Um, but I think that's less important than what is coming now with inferencing and AI ads, because you are going to be in the middle of that. And that's going to open some very interesting opportunities. And then, of course, it's like the question, how is AI going to impact the network, right? Is it going to be more of the same? We just throw more bandwidth at it and we keep reducing cost, maybe some automation, or are there some new elements that are coming in that might even affect architecture, topology, traffic flows, or the whole way that we're doing business? And then, of course, the most important question is, like, what value can network service providers add in this whole AI evolution, how are we going to make money from it, right? I'm not going to sell more routers unless you are going to make more money <laughs> to buy more routers. So that's where I'm coming from. So very briefly, like AI, I think it's now in early stages. Like all the training, it's a huge investment to build um, artificial general intelligence. That's really the quest to, to build digital agents that can basically have all the faculties and abilities that humans have. You can consider this as getting a Harvard degree, which is extremely expensive to get, and there is intrinsic value, but unless you get a job, you're not getting any payback. So that's where inferencing comes in. This is really where all these models that are being trained are being replicated in tons of tons of servers for very specific applications where they are interpreting user data to infer things, to generate new information or insights or automate processes or whatever. So that is the business end of AI. This is where ultimately all the investments in training will have to materialize. And this is not about one big workload for weeks in a data center like training. This is going to be millions of different workloads with different devices uh, in parallel. So, when it comes to AI applications, uh, what are the use cases? Uh, um, and I'm sure a lot of you have been working with like ChatGPT and playing around with that, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. And AI is gonna make its way in many um, live business and mission critical applications where they have to make uh, time critical decisions on very sensitive data that is very personal to users. I think that, for example, computer vision, um, is going to be very important to make the whole physical world observable so that machines can then interact on it. Um, there's many uh, examples of that, but there's also in finance, in, in healthcare, mundane things like patient monitoring is someone falling out of their bed, you know, to quality control in, in factories and, and you name it. Road safety, public safety, there's going to be a lot of applications where AI is going to be critical for success or failure. And while AI will be fueled a lot by the evolution to faster GPUs and more efficient models and feeding it more data, the network is going to be very important to make or break a number of these applications or business cases that I just mentioned. So I tried to categorize them a little bit. Um, so at the top, really consumer applications, the whole evolution to virtual reality, extended reality, spatial computing, you'll get like wearables and headsets with multiple cameras that are looking at what you're looking at. They're tracking your eyeballs, hand gestures, they're taking speech inputs and so on, and they're presenting digital information you know, on your display as you go along. So this is high bandwidth, low latency information that the network then needs to transport with deterministic quality of service requirements. And this is where all your Segment routing and QoS is going to be really important. Second mission critical for business and industry that adds an element of reliability to it and security. 
and also um, the flexibility to have multiple workloads where some are on-premises, on the LAN, uh, others are maybe in a private data center and other workloads in the cloud. And all this within the concept, context of a, a secure virtual private network that's quantum safe as well. And then the last is uh, massive uh, IoT, sensor networks. And this could be smart traffic lights, cameras, anything that is just um, feeding lots of information from many different sources into an AI that is going to then do something with that data. And these devices can be very vulnerable to DDoS attacks. They could be recruited for botnets, and that is going to impact latency you know, of all the other applications and could break them. So that's where data protection, DDoS security is going to be very important. So that's the role of the network. Now let's talk about uh, the AI edge cloud evolution. So at this point, there's really two extremes. It's either you run the AI uh, logic or compute in a big data center, or it's on the device. And that's kind of a dilemma because, you know, you either have to bring the data all the way from the user device to the data center, or you need to put hardware on a customer location or even on the device to run the model there. And there's lots of resource constraints there as well. It could be better rely on smartphones, uh, or it could be the fact that uh, you just don't want data to go to the cloud. So the evolution to edge cloud is where you really are starting to distribute some of those uh, uh, workloads for inferencing. And this, um, this will help to offload data centers so they don't become too big to fail. Uh, but it also helps to reduce the cost of transporting all that data. Um, you get a faster response when you can move the AI processing closer to where the uh, data is being generated and consumed. You also have uh, less exposure to cybersecurity risk because you stay within the parameter of one network and you reduce you know, the amount of distance that traffic needs to travel and can be attacked potentially. And also there is the need of uh, autonomy, right? There's many applications that are so private, you don't want to even connect to a cloud for that. It just has to run in a very local cloud. So, that type of equipment can go in a metro at the central office or uh, even further out at the network edge in a micro data center. Now then the question is who's going to build that? Who's going to buy it? Who's going to operate it? And who's going to make money off it, right? So currently, like the hyperscalers are building out their cloud towards the edge. But even to go to, you know, uh, the big metros, they are hosting their equipment already with like neutral uh, colo providers such as Equinix. And like in the past, basically the model is over the top, right? While network service providers are the bridge between the end user and the cloud, most of the traffic best effort in the past just goes over the top for video, which is fine. For AI, that's not gonna work because uh, caching and buffering and stuff like that for real-time data that is consumed, and, uh, generated and consumed on the fly, is just uh, not going to work. So then it becomes a challenge for hyperscalers, how do they cross that bridge or that mode, right? They're going to run into huge logistical problems to further build out the edge on a global scale. Um, there's going to be data sovereignty issues and just a whole logistical challenge. So this is where edge to cloud comes in, where network service providers are going to um, become hosts of some of that equipment and build out the edge cloud more organically. And this can be wherever the demand is, you put like the servers to, to offload to, to help uh, serve that uh, uh, demand. demand. And this is really also where there is a, a joint interest because a lot of these hyperscalers are also building devices like the latest generation of smartphones, the, the, the Apple 16, uh, Pixel 9, uh, you got your Apple Vision Pro. And nobody's gonna buy these devices and pay for the AI in there if the applications don't work well, right? So, and you're not gonna sell the big 5G server subscription with the latest model smartphone if there's no applications that really need that. So there's really a common interest. Now, when we then look at how is this going to play out on a more technical level, you'll see that um, you'll have like different form factors that you're going to need, like smaller configurations that can be even outdoor, um, you know, near business parks or shopping malls in ports where there is uh, a lot of people needing AI or businesses, but they don't necessarily run it on premises. 
two more centralized uh, locations, telco data centers or central offices. And some applications are for your own use, like you know, OSS or AI RAN or customer relationship management. But also, there will be many applications that you can host on behalf of partners or customers. Now, from a network perspective, and this is becoming <laughs> closer to where I am, broadband ads or multi-access gateway, I think is going to be a very strategic point. Because this is where you're going to break out to this AI as compute. And this is also where you want to have some things set up. Like you want to be able to use this AI as compute for like across both like residential and business. And also regardless of access technology, whether people are connected through fixed wireless access or wireline, you want to be able to efficiently use that pool of resources for all these different applications. And towards the cloud, you want to be able to connect to different clouds, whether it's internet or VPNs or private or co-location data centers. So there's a lot of like, an important switch points and control point that is happening here at multi-access gateway because you control the demarcation with the subscribers and also with all these service handoff points. Now, then how do network service providers uh, fit in and what uh, in the value chain and what are then the uh, services that they offer? So and this is kind of a very simplified view of the end-to-end -end value chain where on the left you have you know, all your software providers, Hugging Face, uh, Entropic, SAP, uh, IBM, you, you name it, uh, and also applications from the big hyperscalers. And then you have your, your cloud infrastructure where Amazon, Microsoft, and Google together are about like 70 or 80 percent of all the cloud there is out there. Uh, and then there is like others, you know, there's Oracle and there's lots of private clouds. And then comes the edge part where there will be um, some of the, like the aggregated ads in the co-location data centers or telco data centers and further down will be on-premises of enterprises or, um, you know, more distributed uh, units. And when you think about services, what is happening in the telco action is more like carrier motel or better breakfast if you compare to co-location centers are more like carrier hotels, right? So these, um, these, these are smaller, but they're closer to the action, right? Uh, to, to where the data is being generated. So based on your capabilities and comfort level, you can basically add different services and, and climb that value chain because you don't need to be a rocket scientist in AI to offer these services. It's just equipment that needs power, space, connectivity, and hands to install it. And that's really what hyperscalers for most of you will be looking for. So your one star is just kind of um, a space, like a hookup for like a mobile data center. It could be next to a fiber cabinet um, um, with reliable power supply. Um, next is like uh, white space. This is your basically um, where you can bring your own rack and um, and you just host it with connectivity and installation. And then you can like further climb the value chain with you know uh, allow renting out rack space for servers or going further into workloads or bare metal. And this is really where you want to partner up because uh, this hardware is going to you know, depreciate in, in a few years, and you're never going to get the latest generation like the hyperscalers do. So this is where you want to be more like a franchise where you're hosting AWS Outpost or Azure Stack or uh, Google Cloud Edge. So that's really where it's going to, uh, to finish off. Um, I think there is a, a big opportunity for network service providers as they live at this, the edge of this hyper-connected world to, to add value and go beyond just connectivity and through hosting services for Edge Cloud, I think that is, uh, that's a great entry point to go into. Um, of course, you have to make room for this, right? I think the tr transition from legacy copper DSL to passive optical networking is gonna free up power and space. And also, of course, the innovation towards, you know, uh, next generation equipment is going to really help to, um, to prepare for this. And no matter what happens, it's always good to save space and power, right? So I'll leave it at this. Of course, uh, there's no key. <laughs> we can help you in all these, uh, these different uh, aspects. But I think it's first important to understand uh, you know, how is this going to make money before we 
think even further. Thank you. Thank you very much.